Amen. Y'all, y'all just tuning in. Y'all, y'all missing it. We just having a good discussion about seafood, meatloaf, and pig feet and chitlins. And yeah, seafood, seafood, meatloaf. That's all. That's all Charles Taylor. Now. Never heard of that. You know, he's bringing stuff from Boston, and we like. He's trying to talk about us for chitlins. All right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Just had to be here to be in the conversation. Amen. To God be the glory. I, I pray that you've had a, a, a blessed week thus far. The weather changing and getting back cold on us again. I pray that you, your families are doing well and all is well with your homes. Uh, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Whether you're here present in person or joining us over the on the uh, live feed, God bless you. We're going to uh, the Lord say so. We're going to finish up tonight uh, with the Book of Lamentations as written by the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord say so. We we should finish up with this tonight. Um, let us let us pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Upon tonight's lesson and that his spirit will dwell among us tonight gracious and all wise God our Father Lord we thank you tonight mm -hmm. we thank you once again for just being our father and being God to us and for us and God with us mm -hmm. we thank you master for all of thy divine blessings and your divine providence over our lives we thank you God for being ruler and governor over our circumstances. I pray now, O oh God, we give you glory for allowing us to come together one more time in this setting, in this series of study that we have embarked upon. We pray, Master, that just one more time, mm -hmm. your Holy Spirit will come and tabernacle with just a few of us for just a little while. Speak to our hearts tonight. You have spoken to us by your Holy Spirit throughout this series. And we thank you for what our ears have heard. We thank you for what you have manifested to us throughout this lesson. We pray now, O oh God, that whatever you have to say to your church tonight, that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. And we shall be careful, O oh God, to give you all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Lamentations chapter 5, <clears throat> Lamentations chapter 5, I'm not sure where we left off last week. I want to say maybe around verse 8 or mm -hmm. verse 9, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, is that right? Yes, it was written, but it was 16. Okay, okay. Stop at verse 9. Okay, so I was, I was just going to pick up at verse 9 either way. I didn't know where we, but I was going to pick up at verse 9 and just, uh, just to remind us of what we what Jeremiah has really kind of uh, gotten into here in this last chapter, Jeremiah's in the middle of a prayer. He's praying to God. Um, and I stated last week that on the surface, it seems as his prayer is almost a complaint to God, as if it's almost a complaint to God. He's kind of rehashing the misery of their condition and the misery of their situation that they have, that has befallen them due to their own sins and their own wickedness, um, their disobedience to God. As God's people, as God's covenant people, Jeremiah has been telling his people throughout the entire book, this is our fault. This is on us. Look at what we have done. We must see ourselves. And now, because time has gone by, Jeremiah has been weeping and crying, and now he's just giving one last plea to God. One last cry to God for mercy and compassion on his sheep. So <clears throat> picking up where we left off, we, we talked briefly on last week in the in the first seven, eight verses, and we kind of just, you know, talked a little bit about how Jeremiah was just hashing back, rehashing over to the Lord where where we are, the state of the church, the state of our condition. He has said in verse five, we are closely pursued. We must pay for our water that we drink, our wood that comes 
this is from our own land and now we must labor for it and pay for it and we were getting it for free. Our fathers have sinned, know that they no longer exist and we're bearing their punishments. Slaves rule over us, we're no longer the head but we are now the tail. Um, and you told us that we would be the head and not the, t and not the tail. Um, and then we get to verse 9. And, and I just want to read real quick. I'm just going to kind of just read through these um, all the way down to verse 16 and 17. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about them as we go through them. But I just want to kind of just read them. And again, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Translation. Um, been in this, this translation throughout this series of studies. So we'll stay right here. But beginning at verse 9, we secure our food at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. He's speaking about how they had to just, how they even had to risk their own lives just for food, just for survival. That's kind of crazy to me because the thing is when I look at some of our churches today, because remember everything that we're talking about in regards to Israel, Israel being the old covenant church, the Old Testament church, we are the New Covenant church. But at the same time, we must understand that how God dealt with his people in the Old, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, it tells us how he deals with us today. It's how he deals with us today. Because the thing is, yes, they were under the dispensation of the law, and we are now in the New Covenant under the dispensation of grace. But how God deals with us and handles us when he is displeased or when we are in a state of disobedience or when we are out of order, we can learn from how he dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. But when I look at that, when it says they basically had to uh, risk their lives just to eat, just for survival, it's almost like they had to risk their own lives. Um, I wonder if churches sometimes feel like they're taking a risk by not going along to get along. Are they taking a risk? You know, uh, churches that won't go along with some of the things that have now become the norm in other churches. What risk are they taking for their own survival? Because they may have people in their congregation who don't agree. Who's saying, hey, this, uh, these other churches are doing it, why ain't y'all? Well, I'm going over here because I think that's okay and I agree with it and I think it's fine and you all won't do it. I'm leaving. What risk do churches take by still following the order of God? What God requires, what God expects of his church. It's a risk that they take just for their survival. Our skin is as hot as an oven from the ravages of hunger. Women have been raped in Zion, virgins in the city, in the cities of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Now I looked at verses 11 and 12. And of course, when we talk about women have been raped in Zion, Zion meaning Jerusalem, the holy city. Okay, this is also where the temple was. Before it was laid in ruins. But this is in Zion, the holy city, Jerusalem, okay? So we think in the temple, we think in the church, we think in where they assemble themselves together. And so, of course, as we think about it, when we think about God's church, God's church is what? A bride. It's always in the feminine, okay? It's the bride. The bride of Christ is his church. And so when I think about it and I look at it and I say that the women have been raped in Zion, I can't help but think of how God's church That's right. is being raped over and over again and left for dead. Raped by ravenous wolves in sheep clothes who come and they set up shop as pastors and board members and trustees in effort to rob the church and to rape her blind and leave her destitute. Hmm. How many churches have gone through that where they've had hirelings as pastors who have done nothing but come in to take and, 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 and rob her of all that he can and then leave and go on to the next victim? It happens all the time. 
It happens all the time. Okay? And he's talking about the women and then also the young women. The same thing is going on. Princes and elders. When I think of the princes and elders, yes, they were talking about their true princes of the land and their elders are showing no respect, meaning the older folks. And, you know, it's a sad day when people no longer respect the elderly. It's a sad day. But at the same time, I look at this and I see the princes and elders as it also referring to preachers, true preachers of the gospel, the ones who are still carriers of the truth, preachers and elders and pastors who are still trying to be a, a mouthpiece for God, a mouthpiece for the truth of the gospel and how they are constantly ridiculed and hung out to dry because they the refusal to go with the crowd. We see that all the time, too. They're talked about. If they don't go with everybody else, they're marginalized, they're ostracized. If they don't go with everybody else, they're forced to try to go on their own. And it's just them. It's just like, you know, it's like the way Elijah was. He thought he was all by himself. I'm the only one. I'm the only priest. I'm the only prophet that hasn't bowed his knee to Baal. I'm the only one. And, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not going to lie, sometimes I've had that feeling of loneliness. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for some of the preachers God has sent my way. Ministers that are up under me are also friends in the ministry that I have and other pastors that have like-minded spirits. I'm grateful for that and I don't take that for granted because we are few and far between. Mm -hmm. We are few and far between. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. But I look at this text and I just hear, and, I'm, and, I, and, and, and it's just giving me this illustration and this visual of the state of God's church. And I can't help but see it all today too well. It all looks like it's just like looking in a mirror. And I'm like, wow, this is happening today. That's most definitely going on. Look at how he goes on and says, the elders have been left the city gate, the young men, their music. Joy has left our hearts. The crown is falling from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Verse 15 kind of stuck with me for a moment. 15 and 16 did. Joy has left our heart. Joy has left our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. You know, uh, as I stated, this pandemic is no accident. Yeah. God is intentional. Right. Taking us from being able to come together and fellowship and worship on one accord with like-minded believers and brothers and sisters in Christ. We miss that, don't we? Mm -hmm. We miss that. I'm grateful for the the time that we have been able to come back and the little bit that we have been able to do. But I want you to think about it in these last, it's almost two years now, right? We're almost two years into this pandemic. Some churches still have their doors closed. Some churches, the only time they come together is for funerals. Think about that. There's more mourning. There's more grieving in this season. In the fellowship and the coming together of the saints. Than there is for us coming together for worship and praise and thanksgiving and teaching and preaching and fellowship. There's more mourning in this season than anything else. Our dancing and joy and shouting in the church has turned into crying and grieving and mourning, groans and moans of loss and suffering. That's what we've come to. That's where we are right now. He goes on and says that the crown has fallen from our head. The crown has fallen from our head. You do know that, you know, just kind of piggybacking a little bit more on verse 15. The bitterness 
of mourning, grieving, and depression can seem worse than death. Because the thing is, the truth of the matter is, a person who is overwhelmed with grief and mourning and depression, they want to die. <laughs> they feel like death is a relief from their condition. They feel like death is freedom or liberty from their mourning state and their grief state, their grief stricken state in their state of depression. Like that's so, it, it kind of gives the picture like that's a worse condition to be in than to be dead. Yes, ma'am. What what in particular? So I make sure I understand what, you, what is what why suicide really? Depression, stress. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I believe that no doubt. It, it, it's this season. You know, I've been calling it a a season of death. That's, that's what we've been in for two years. The entire world is grieving. It's mourning. It's suffering to some degree. And it has touched everybody. No one has escaped it. No one has been shielded from it. I don't care who you are, where you live, where you're from, your economic status, your social status, it does not matter. You have been impacted and affected by this season. And some folks, some people don't have don't know the Lord. And some people aren't as strong in the Lord as they thought they were. Mm -hmm. Some people have lost a lot and not sure about how to handle it. And like I said, when folk get to the point, it's just like, I mean, you can be grieved and stressed so much to where you would, you may not kill yourself because you may not be, you may be too much of a coward to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, I don't know, I, I, ain't, I would never do that either, but. You may not do that, but you may want God to take you out. You may want to die and say, I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to leave this place. This is too much for one person to bear. People have felt like that. People feel like that today. Yes, sir. In Jeremiah, in the earlier chapters, kind of speak on that same thing. Yes, sir. The whole thing started coming on them that they'd be better off dead. Be better off dead. It said that those who it said those that God had already killed during the siege were better off than those that remained. That's right. Yeah, but um, it gets to the point that, um, like you were saying, in this season where I work in the medical field, mm -hmm. and we had like four nurses go out to get three weeks apart, and um, we felt like we couldn't lose to win what we there for. Yeah. And each and every day that we go around, we see different faces because we're so used to the face that was there that was part of the team and now half of the team is gone, gone home. Yeah. And and then um, they, you know, some of them in a battle. Yeah. Because they're not into God. And some of them is in the battle because they just giving up. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And I mean, you think about it. All the death that we have seen is not just because of COVID. Yeah, right. Think about it, you all. Here we are in December here in the state of Kentucky. Or let's just say it's the state of, it's just the city of Lexington. Yeah. We've hit a record high in homicides this year. Mm -hmm. Just in the city of Lexington. Yes, sir. They just killed my dude two hours ago, but. Do what? They just killed my dude, my friend. You just got a friend that just got killed today? Mm -hmm. Two hours ago. Ramon Penny. They just killed him. Ramon Penny? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know him. He's dead. Mm -hmm. Brian Station running back at all, all the time. He's one of my classmates. Yeah. I work with him. Man, he just gets gunned down like that several times with some live up a lake right there. Wow. And homicides are up all across the state. He just made the record for Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're up all over the country. Mm -hmm. People are dying. For all 
the Lord has taken out, I'm talking about pillars, mm -hmm. matriarchs, mm -hmm. patriarchs. Mm -hmm. He's removing mm -hmm. all kinds of folks. God has not been playing in this season. Yes, sir. Even within the AME, well, within the AME and the COVID, they lost just within the first six months of COVID. Yes, sir. They lost over 60 of their major pastors. Yes, sir. And even within the Baptists, they lost some they lost bishops in the church. In the major church. pastors. Mm -hmm. I mean, brothers who they got the vaccine when it first came out, they were low, yeah. growing. Mm -hmm. And it's looking like the Lord is bringing in pastors who are having a heart, a zeal for God, but they don't have the knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't serve him, but they just, they're not there like the brothers that have gone on. It might, might be a cleansing time. It's a, <laughs> what you say, the Lord is mm -hmm. purging the house, mm -hmm. yeah. so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I actually think it's more of a monetary thing for the pastors rather than the faith of God, the impact is a reflection or representation of God. Therefore, you know, it was never about him anyway, it was about them. Yeah, it was about themselves. That's right. Yes, sir. And that type of thing mm -hmm. right there, you see the grass. And yes, sir. See, that's why you start to see them Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. The Bible called them hirelings. That's right. You know what I mean? The right. Bible called them hirelings, man. You know, um, wolves in sheep clothing. Mm -hmm. Told them they were pastors after filthy lucre. Mm -hmm. You know, um, meaning money and monetary gain. Yeah, that's right. uh, mm -hmm. God is just not pleased with that. Not among his church. That's right. He's not pleased about that. It's been a season of mourning. In verse 16, the crown is fallen from our head. The crown, the crown, the crown. What is he talking about when he says the crown? He's saying all that we as God's people have been adorned with. <laughs> all the ornaments that we have been graced with by being children of the living God. <laughs> saying that it's fallen off our heads. It has faded away. Think about that. I mean, I know that, you know, in speaking of these times, you know, because they used to wear crowns at weddings and all kinds of things and feasts and stuff like that. They no longer had this. But I'm talking about when we think of ourselves as the people of God and the adornment and all that comes with that in this life, not in the life to come, in this life. What we represent, we represent a blessed people. We represent a holy God. We represent a loving people, a compassionate people, a giving people, a people who love those regardless if they love us back. The glory of the Lord. That's what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to show others the face of God. Amen. Do you think that's how people see us when they look at the church? Amen. We're no longer adorned that way. We're no longer held in that type of esteem. We're, he said our crown has fallen from our head. Our crown has fallen from our head. And then he goes on and says, woe unto us. And you know, when you see that woe in the Bible, it's talking about mm -hmm. extreme Destitution. misery destitute state okay it's misery is what he is saying woe unto us that we have fallen to such a degree woe unto us church of God that we no longer have a voice we no longer have the strong arm in our communities that we used to have the impact that we used to have. There was a time when folk had respect for pastors and preachers when they came in the door or when they showed up. That time is no more. There was a time when folk had respect for the elderly. That time is no more. There was a time when a church in a community was regarded as a place of hope. Now, they'll use that church to shoot dice. 
sell drugs in the parking lot without any recourse or reservation. It's no longer the case. So he says, woe unto us. And he says, why? Because we have sinned. Because we have sinned. He's saying, church of God, don't ignore it. Yes, this is bad. Yes, this is the state that we're in. But make no mistake about it. We caused it and brought it upon ourselves. Because what we allow. Because what we accepted. It goes on in verse 17. And he says, because of this, our heart is sick. Because of these, our eyes grow dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate and has jackals prowling in it. Look at what he said. Because of Mount Zion, remember I told you again that we're talking about the church there. We're talking about the church. We're talking about the, the temple. We're talking about in Jerusalem. Um, here it is. This is the place where the people of God could come together. And as far as in their mind and in their spirit, this is where they would come together to get in the presence of God. They would come together to get in the presence of God. And, and you know the holies of holy. For one, couldn't nobody go in there but the high priest. And he could only go in there once a year. And now he's saying, because if anybody else would go in, they would die. Like, no one just they couldn't go. You went in that room, you died. Mm -hmm. There was consequences. He said, now it lays desolate and jackals foxes are trampling on the same area where the holies and holies once was and nothing happens to it. Where man would be struck down immediately for going in that space now we got foxes and jackals that just walking around trampling on it and nothing happens. How is that? Beloved, that's a when you look at that picture, we are his church. The Bible says that we, the church, are the pillar of truth. He dwells among us. He dwells among us and nothing is worse than God no longer dwelling among his people. What can be worse than that? Then knowing that these people are now to the point where they feel like there's no way for them to feel the presence of God. Now the thing is, 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 is yes, you know, and I coming together in modern in modern society, yes, I, I if I'm a born, if I'm a child of God, I can feel the presence in the Holy Spirit, you know, in my car, okay, at home in my bedroom, in the bathroom, wherever. I can feel the presence of God at any moment, right? Of course I can. However, it's something about the assembling of ourselves together. Because not only then can I feel his presence, but you can see it. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> you can see it. I, I, can, I can see the presence, the manifested power of, of God, of the Holy Spirit, just from the front to the back, just flowing through his church, through his service. You can see the power of God in the preacher. You can see the power of God in the choir and in the deacon praying and, 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 and sister so-and-so shouting. And you can just, you can see the manifested presence of God. Imagine this being ripped away. You know, it's nothing, I, I've said it before, it's nothing I can't stand worse than a damn church. <laughs> Where you just feel nothing. People just looking at you like a knot on a log, like a dead pew. You might as well be talking to empty pews. There's nothing I can't stand worse than that. A choir that has no anointing. A choir that has no anointing. 
You know how difficult it is to preach to a body like that? Make me want to sit down. It's hard. There's nothing worse than that. But the thing is, what we have here, what I see is I see churches where the presence of God is not there. And you got wolves in pulpits. Foxes and jackals. Anybody can go up there. Anybody can preach. Anybody can address God's people. And nothing happens. And nobody cares. They don't get struck down. Just like the jackals and the foxes trampling all over the holies of holies. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate and has jackals prowling in it, you, Lord, are enthroned forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Beloved, regardless, this is, this is the good news. Because as Jeremiah, you kind of see the switch right now. He's been first talking about the shape that we're in. And now in verse 19, he says, but you, O Lord, you, O Lord, you will remain forever. Church of the living God. Yes, we are messed up. Yes, we are as fickle as we've always been. Yes, we seem to change with the times. We change with whatever society deems acceptable. And we somehow gravitate towards it. We somehow allow it to be grafted into our procedures and our ceremonies. But the good thing about our God and all of our wrong and all of our troubles and all of our suffering, God remains the same. He does not change. He does not change. Who he is does not change. His love does not change. His grace does not change. He's still God and his throne still remains. He's still governor. He's still ruler. And that is where we can find solace because if we belong to him he can't change his mind he's not going to change his mind toward us that's good news for us he's not going to change his mind towards us no matter how bad we can be we're still his bride He's not going to throw us away. He's not going to leave us to ourselves. He will still come see about us. He says, thou throne from generation to generation. In other words, not only is he the same yesterday, but he'll be the same today and forevermore. He will forever reign. Then he goes on and he says, why do you then continually forget us? Lord, you are God. You reign forever and ever. Why do you continually forget us? Abandon us for our, are you going to abandon us for our entire lives? The first thing is, we must see how far gone we truly are. We must see how far gone we truly are. We must see how far away we have strayed away from God's order. Away from God's order. And then we must realize that only God can turn us around. We must realize that only God can put us back on the right path. Only God can reorient us and have us do a 180 and about face to be back on a road that pleases him. Only God 
can do that. You and I, for one, we're not strong enough to do that on our own. And two, I don't know if we can live long enough to do that on our own because we didn't get to where we are overnight. But it would take God. It would take a supernatural event hmm. like COVID. <laughs> Something supernatural because the thing is, you all got to understand at this time, Israel was a powerhouse. Okay? They wasn't just somebody. They wasn't anybody that you would just run up on. Okay, they would they had high walls. You didn't just attack them. And yet their walls were breached. And yet they fell. And yet they lost their homes. They lost their church, their temple, their place of worship. They lost everything that identified them. As the people of God. They had lost it. Only God can restore that. Only God can restore that. So we must realize that only he can turn us. I'm reminded of what God told. King Solomon. He just simply told him that in my people. Who are called by my name. If they would humble themselves and pray. I wonder how many bishops and pastors and preachers are willing to admit to themselves in this season, I was wrong. I was wrong. I did this for my own selfish gain. I did this for my own desires I did this out of I allowed this to happen out of neglect because I was neglecting my office or I was neglecting my sheep I turned a blind eye to that I thought I was entitled to more because of who I am I thought I was entitled to more because don't you know my name <laughs> my name is Joel Osteen Bishop Jakes, Creflo Dollar, you don't know my name? You think I'm coming for that little bit of money? Do you know how much money I'll bring in your church just because I showed up? Negro, please. <laughs> but he says if my people would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked way, Seek my face. He says, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive them of their sins. And then will I heal their land. There can never be true healing if there's no pardon. And you can't be pardoned without true repentance. God is looking at us today. God has put us in the fire. We're in the melting pot. We're in there. We're in the eye of the storm. We're in there. And the Lord has been speaking this entire time. And you know what? It's been a long season, y'all. It's been a long trying season. And I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I'm about tired. I am. I'm about tired. So I declare I'm listening. <laughs> Lord, I'm listening. And I'm sounding the alarm. And I'm crying in the wilderness that somebody will hear and be changed. 
I'm banking on God to make it happen. I really, I, I, because I don't know what else to do at this point. All I know is something has got to change. What is the point of all of this is when it's all over, we just the same old way we were. We was the same old church, just as divided as we've always been. Just going through the motions like we've always done. Just come in here, have church on Sunday morning, go home. We've got to be more than that. That's not showing people the love of God. That's not thy kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. That's not what that is. When we pray that prayer, as the church of God, we are to be lifting God's kingdom in earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're supposed to be showing. Turn thou us unto thee. Lord, bring us back to yourself. Bring us back to yourself so we may return. Renew our days as in former times. Unless you have completely rejected us and are intensely angry with us. Lord, bring us back. Turn us, Lord. And then in that last verse, I think he was just speaking as a man. Saying, Father, unless you just gonna throw us all away. But Jeremiah knew better. He had already received the prophecies of God. He knows that the captivity is only gonna last 70 years. He already knows this. He says, so Lord, don't remember who we are. It almost sounds like Moses. When the Lord told Moses, Moses, get down from this mountain. For the people down there done corrupted themselves. He said, in case they unfoot, they must not know who I am, but I'll kill all of them. Mm -hmm. And Moses said, Lord, you don't want to do that. Don't do that, Lord, please. Then they'll say that you just brought them out here to kill them, and they won't, they won't praise your name. People will just say that you just killed all your folks. The Bible said the Lord repented of himself. Hmm. Jeremiah was just saying, Father, remember us. Have compassion. Have mercy on us. Love us in spite of us. Turn us in spite of us. Restore us in spite of us. Whatever you got to do, whatever you got to cut away, Whatever you got to do in this season, oh God, restore unto us the joy of our salvation. We are your children, God. And yes, we have sinned. But Lord, you are a merciful God. You are a gracious God. You are a loving God. You are a forgiving God. So, Master, we ask for forgiveness. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We ask you to forgive us of our shortcomings and forgive us of where we've fallen short of the mark. Forgive us where we have misrepresented you. Forgive us for where we've made decisions for ourselves and We've made decisions for our own survival, thinking we need to put our matters, take matters into our own hands, as opposed to just taking it to the altar and leaving it with you, expecting you to be who you've always been, and that is our provider, and that is the one who makes a way out of no way by providing our every need. That's right. Forgive us, oh God. Forgive us. I pray that you've been blessed. I pray that you've been blessed by this series. I pray that, beloved, it is my heart's desire. It is my heart's desire 
that whenever God sees fit to end this season that we're in, and I ain't talking about the COVID-19 season, I'm talking about this season of death and mourning and grief. Whenever God sees fit to end this season, I pray he puts us on a path of restoration. And I'm speaking about his church. That he puts us on a path of restoration. That churches will be able to come together regardless of denomination. Regardless of race, color, or creed. That we can put aside silly differences in worship and just worship one God in truth, in spirit, and in truth. I pray that God will put us on that path. I pray, Greater Liberty, that He will allow us to be a beacon, that He will allow us to be a vessel in this community. To show that we don't pass judgment on anyone or anything. We just love God and we are his people. We ain't trying to be good Baptists. Huh? We ain't trying to be good Baptists. We just trying to love God. And that means by loving you. That's it. We just want to serve God. That's it. We just want him to be pleased with our service. So I pray that God will continue to build us a platform, give us resources to be able to do ministry on an exponential level. I'm trusting God for that. But I love you with the love of Christ. I pray that you've been blessed. Um, what are we now, like two weeks to Christmas? Saturday will be two weeks this weekend. I'll let you all know Sunday if I do something next week or week. I, uh, I'll let you know Sunday because I just don't know if I want to go ahead and get started on a new series. Anyway, we'll see. I'll let you know on Sunday. Um, I want to ask the body of Christ to be in prayer. Uh, for the mother of Sister Tanisha Marshall, um, continue to keep um, Bob Rogers in your prayers as well. Um, continue to keep Mother Turley in your prayers. Please say a special prayer for her. Um, also, we we'll continue to pray for the family. Uh, Sister Michelle Jones will continue to pray for her, asking for her nephew. Also, Sister uh, Penny. Continue to pray for her and her family. Uh, continue to keep Sister Mary Walker in your prayers as well. Uh, Sister Smith, we continue to pray for your mother as well, Donna. Um, I'm trying to think. Thank you again, and continue to pray. Lift me and my my family in your prayers. Um, amen. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. Also, a reminder: this coming Sunday, we will not have. Sunday school this coming Sunday we will not have Sunday school um, we'll be praying for our own elder Emmanuel Young as he'll be going to Louisville to proclaim the gospel there um, so we pray safe travels for he and his family um, I think that's all I have any other announcements or prayer requests keep the university in your prayers the University of Kentucky yes, yes ma'am yes ma'am Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for tonight. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for this series of study and how you have blessed it and how you have just illuminated your word right before our very eyes. And, and Lord, how you've just shown us ourselves through your text and shown us how you deal with your church and how you love your church and how you chasten your church. And Lord, and how you will not sit idly by and allow us to misrepresent you allow us to just run out of order but that you will show up and be our father 
that you do and when you show up Lord that you come with a rod of correction Lord I'm grateful for that I am grateful for that so master as we go continue to go through this season I pray Lord that you will allow us to hear what you are saying to us but I pray oh God that you will protect us while we're in this season that you will comfort us that you will still have mercy on us even as we are going through chastisement I pray God that when it's all said and done I pray Lord that your purpose will be fulfilled I pray Lord that your church will be restored tenfold I pray master that we will be better or have gone through this season than have not ever embarking upon it. So Lord, I'm just crazy enough to glorify you in the middle of a storm. Mm -hmm. Crazy enough to still worship you and tell you I love you and I trust you even while I'm going through. Yes. Yes. So Lord, continue to be with us now. I lay all of these names that we have stated tonight, I lay them all at your feet. Every family, every household, I lay them at your feet, Father. I lay this city, this state, this community at your feet. Just got the word about Brother Ramon Penny. I pray for his family. I pray for his family. Lord, you are still worthy to be praised. Yes, yes. You are still worthy. And we see you working. Lord, I'm like the songwriter. Whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without us. Mm -hmm. Be with us now, Father, as we leave this place until we meet again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Amen.